I'd like to invite our speaker, uh, Julie Zhu, who is the VP of Product Design at Facebook, where um, she leads the design teams, many design teams. Um, she's also the author of The Making of a Manager. And many of you may know her from her popular blog, The Year of the Looking Glass, where she writes about technology, design, and leadership. I've learned so much from Julie. I've been following her, her blog since 2013 when she was just getting started with it. Um, one of my favorite blog posts since then was around quality. Quality is not a trade-off. Um, and the fun fact about Julie is that she loves ramen. It's her spirit animal. With that, let's give it a hand to Julie. Hi everyone, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm still not really over the fact that, you know, uh, many of you guys were out there, I'm facing a huge crowd today, and you all came to see me. You know, I'll talk a little bit more about my journey and how I even got to writing and all of that, but really one of the most rewarding parts has been, you know, meeting face-to-face -face and connecting personally with people who have either found my words over the years or have recently picked up my book or, you know, have maybe heard me speak or talk in another capacity. So it's a beautiful day in San Francisco. It's a wonderful night. I'm so grateful to Julie and Rethink, uh, as well as Zendesk for having us here. And I'm really grateful to all of you for being here as well. So uh, I'm, we're I talk a lot about feedback tonight, which is one of my favorite topics. Uh, but first, you know, I'm going to introduce myself. Yes, I do love ramen. It is my spirit food, and I have actually, you know, taken pilgrimages just for the sake of getting ramen in Japan, LA, and all of the top places. Uh, so if you love ramen too, you know, come by me afterwards. We'll geek out about our favorite places. I have two really lovely children. Um, they're four years old and two years old. I also have another one on the way, uh, which is a boy. And I feel like I can share that now because I'm starting to look in that awkward moment where people are like, have you just gained a few pounds or, you know, are you actually pregnant? <laughs> This is a, a, a photo of my kids at Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, and they look, you know, like they're giving each other a hug. In fact, what's happened is my daughter has tied a scarf around her and her brother. He's about 30 seconds away from realizing that he can't get away and throwing a total meltdown. So we had a really nice weekend last year where we then took that roller coaster that you see in the back, and this is what they look like on that roller coaster. <laughs> My husband and I had a great time. <laughs> I work at Facebook, where I was uh, fortunate enough to be there when it was a startup, you know, about 100 or so people. I joined as Facebook's very first intern. I was an engineering intern. It was a college site. It had 8 million users. You know, I knew it, and no one else knew about it, uh, because, you know, I was using the product in college. and. Uh, you know, some friends of mine who had been there encouraged me to join because they were like, well, you love to use the product and, you know, we've got big dreams and we're, you know, not just going to be a college site forever. And I didn't actually know what product design was until the first day that I joined. Uh, I, you know, I had interviewed as an engineering intern. Another fun fact is that I got asked zero coding questions in my interview. And to this day, I believe that I snuck through, you know? They just, they hired me without actually doing a proper assessment. Uh, but I showed up at work my first day, and my mentor at the time, uh, her name was Ruchi, and she was Facebook's first female engineer uh, as, uh, at the time. You know, she was like, well, I am actually gonna take a different role. I'm gonna be a product manager because our company needs product managers. I don't really know what that means, but you're gonna need to find yourself a different mentor. <laughs> and then she asked me, what kind of code do you like to write? And I told her I was really interested in the front end because I really like the parts where, you know, people were interacting with, you know, the things that you were putting on the screen. And she's like, I'm gonna sit you down with the designers. So I was like, okay. So she led me over to that small group of designers, and there were about four or five people there at the time. And that was how I got introduced to the idea that you know, one could be a product designer as a profession. Now I should back up a little bit and say, you know, I had actually, one of my big hobbies in middle school and high school was 
uh, was doing digital art and illustration. And so, you know, I pirated Photoshop, and who didn't at the time, really? <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, and, and learned, you know, how to, you know, uh, draw and, and illustrate. And then I decided that I needed to, you know, show them off to the world. And that was how I learned, you know, HTML and CSS and JavaScript with the whole purpose of building websites to showcase my illustrations. And in that art community at the time, you know, one of the things that you had to do is, you know, to prove how great of an artist you were, you had to redesign your website every six weeks. Because, you know, that's just, that's how, that's how we all did it. And so, you know, we all taught ourselves kind of the latest tricks around frames and iframes and tables and, and all of that. So I wasn't coming into it completely like I'd, you know, never used Photoshop or never, uh, you know, done any kind of website design before. But I just didn't know it was a thing that you could do you know, as your profession and get paid for it. Uh, so I was lucky to have, you know, learned about product design and, you know, been mentored by some wonderful designers who taught me a lot more about the fundamentals of design over these years. Um, and, you know, at the time we were small enough that everybody was wearing different hats, so it wasn't at all strange that I started to, you know, produce my own design work. And, by the way, all of the designers had to be technical in those early days. You know, we were a website, um, but front-end design, or front-end enge engineering and design were kind of the same role. And so all the designers were also writing their front-end engineering code for, for the website. So that was my journey. Um, about three years later, you know, our, our team had grown to about double its size. And my manager said, hey, I can't manage so many people anymore. We need another manager. And, you know, you seem like you get along with everyone, so how about it? And I was like, sure. Uh, and that was how I started to manage designers as well. And, you know, I still remember basically not knowing anything uh, about management, but taking it on because, like many things in those periods, you know, you just sort of rolled with it. You did what had to be done, and you, you know, you played, you, you played different hats. And how many of you are actually at startups right now? So you kind of know a little bit more of a, that vibe, right? Where you, you know, you're sort of helping out wherever uh, is needed. So over the years, it's been, you know, I've had the great privilege of actually having my job feel completely different every single year due to the scale of growth that our company, you know, uh, saw and as well as the fact that we, you know, were building new things every year. We were entering new markets. We were, you know, encountering new challenges and problems that we'd never tackled before. And that was really exciting and that afforded me a lot of opportunities to learn and make mistakes and, you know, put out a lot of products that I thought were awesome and some that weren't so awesome. Uh, I would say that, you know, these are all of the emotions that I feel at work. Uh, probably the one I, the two that I continue to feel the most often are, you know, love and gratitude for the people that I work with and, you know, all of the people who have had an impact on me and have taught me things over the years, as well as, you know, the, the little wonder emoji, uh, because I think that what's so cool about working in Silicon Valley and in technology is that, you know, there's never a dull moment. We're always doing things that are different and, you know, using the latest technology to help build and bring to life, you know, wonderful products that change the world for many groups of people. Okay, so about five years ago, um, I started a blog. It's called The Year of the Looking Glass. How many of you are maybe have read a thing or two from it? Great. Uh, and so the, the, the origin story of this blog is, um, you know, I've been managing at this point for, for maybe uh, four or five years. And there was this one thing that I was just really, really bad at. And that was speaking up in front of a large group of people. So, you know, what I was, I'm awesome, you know, I'm really engaged. If we were like in a group of three or four, you know, I'm, I'm really like, you know, excited to be there. And then in like a room of 20 people, I would just totally freeze and I would have nothing to say. And it's because, you know, I had this kind of fear that if I opened my mouth in front of all of those people and I said something stupid, like, God forbid, you know, what, how, how am I going to come across? And, you know, this prevented me from, I think, being as effective as I could. And I got, you know, some feedback from my managers and other people around me being like, hey, you know, you had that other idea that you were telling me about, but then you had, you know, the opportunity to be in that meeting and that review. And like, why didn't you say anything? 
And so it was something that I knew that I wanted to work on. You know, it was uh, one of those uh, barriers that I really wanted to overcome. And so I thought about, you know, what's something that's kind of scary for me? And well, the answer was putting my opinion out there in front of a large group of people. And so what's a practice that I could get into that's going to help me overcome that? And that was when I set the goal to hit the publish button on a piece of writing that I was going to put out there on the internet for whoever to read and just be okay with that. You know, just be comfortable with hitting that button every single week for 52 weeks. That was my New Year's resolution. And in the very beginning, it was, you know, it was like me staring at a screen for seven hours, being like, okay, here's a sentence. Wait, wait, this isn't my voice. That's not how I want to come across. Am I, you know, sounding smart enough? But at the end of that process, you know, at the end of the 52 weeks, it became so much easier. I wouldn't say it was totally natural then, but, you know, I could sit down and have an idea and know that I was, you know, trying to, I was wrestling with some problem at work, you know, maybe it was hiring or maybe it was like, how do we, you know, questions about like, what is great design quality? And that practice gave me time to sit down and, you know, try to make sense of what it was that I was thinking. And so it was like me writing a letter to myself every week, you know, to, to encourage me or to say, hey, this is like what I think is maybe the ideal way or, you know, the way to, to think about this particular problem. And so I continued it even after that year because I, I personally felt like I was getting so much value out of it. But the blog was started, you know, purely for me and, and, and this like, you know, trying to get over that, uh, that, that fear of mine. But what's been really valuable and, um, and, and, you know, surprising is that it's actually resonated with a lot of other people. And in particular, I think the things that resonated the most were, you know, the, the times where I talked about the struggles, right? Or, you know, hey, uh, you know, it's like I feel like an imposter a lot, or, you know, this stuff is really hard, or, you know, there's not a lot of other um, maybe representation for some of the things that we believe. And, you know, I think of design today, you know, design and the community is so much larger and richer than it was, you know, 10 years ago when I started when there wasn't, you know, that many new, this was even before the time of the invention of the iPhone, but there weren't that many, you know, interactive experiences on the web. And now we have that and, you know, design is a growing industry and profession. Uh, but, it, you know, there wasn't like tons of other literature and uh, other things out there. And so uh, it was really valuable for me to hear that, you know, my words had connected with other people who were going through the same thing. And that leads me to where, where we are now, which is my book. And this came out about almost a month ago. And the reason why I decided to write it is, and, and write this book now, is because, you know, this is the book that I felt like I had to write now. And it's a topic that I really, really care about, which is, you know, what is it like to be new to management? What is it like to be a leader in the early phases of your career? when you're still encountering a lot of situations that are new and challenging. Maybe you're encountering those feelings where you don't feel prepared or you don't feel like you know what you're doing. This is all of the stuff that I felt when I was 25. I remember going to a bookstore and you know, trying to find some resources about management. And you know, there's tons of great books out there, but many of them were all about here's a particular big idea, or here's an angle where we've done a lot of organizational research, and if you put this into practice, then your team is gonna get way more effective. And all of that was helpful, but there wasn't anything that was like, here is the basics. You know, here's like the, you know, 101 of management. Here's why you should do a one-on-one -on -one and what your one-on-one -on -one should be about. Here's, you know, how you should think about running a meeting. Here's how you think about hiring and interviewing people and all of the steps that that takes, or how you think about delegation, or even very, very basically, what is the job of a manager? You know, what, like, how do we know if someone is doing a great job or, you know, doing a mediocre job or, frankly, doing a bad job? And even though we've gone through lives and our careers having been managed by other people and having examples to look at, a lot of what I felt was that I don't think I really truly internalized and understood the first principles at the time, you know, the why behind all of the things that are best practices, you know, for, for managers. So this is the book that I wish I had at 25, you know, I wanted to write it in a way that was 
practical and accessible and it was like, you know, we went for coffee and it's like someone that you trust telling you about all of this stuff through their own experience. And it's been really rewarding to be able to go and, you know, talk about it and, and you know, share some of the learnings and, you know, the research that I've done through the course of writing the book. But this leads us to chapter four, which is where, why we're here tonight. And it's one of my favorite topics because I consider it the most important skill of management, which is feedback. And namely, giving feedback, which you know, managers have to do, but also receiving feedback and asking for feedback. So that's what the rest of this is gonna be about. And hopefully we'll, uh, as Julie mentioned, we'll be doing some exercises and hopefully make some new friends in the process. Okay, so first, I want you to close your eyes and imagine, you know, or recreate the situation where someone gave you really bad feedback. So here's my story. Uh, this is, you know, shortly, this might have even been before uh, I became a manager, but we had an intern on our design team and he came with us for a summer and later he left and he went back to school. Uh, but one of the things that he did was, was that, you know, he was very, very interested and passionate about the products that we were doing. So, you know, he would write, um, like, a, we get a, e a weekly email from him that was like this long critique of, you know, some new feature that we had developed. And, you know, for the most part, you know, they were like extremely detailed. We could tell he was super enthusiastic. Uh, but one time, you know, someone was like, oh, hey, you know, we got another email, come over. And we all gathered to look. And, you know, at the top of the email, I remember very distinctly, there was this line, did you mean for this to be so terrible? <laughs> and, you know, and I think there were, you know, some new members on the team who hadn't known him when he was, you know, with us for the internship, who were just like horribly offended. Uh, but those of us who knew him, you know, we, we kind of sort of understood that it just was his way, he, you know, he clearly wasn't great at giving feedback, uh, but he, his, his heart and his intentions were in the right place. And, so we were able to kind of look past the actual words and, you know, uh, sort of wave them off. And the story has a happy ending in that this person ended up joining the team. He went on to become a manager and he became, ironically, the manager that completely uh, revamped our critique process for all future designers. <laughs> but, you know, we never let him forget this, uh, even to this day. Now I want you to think about the, you know, best feedback that you've ever received in your life or in your career. What would you consider the best feedback? So for me, I had a report uh, once, his name was Robin, and he was someone, you know, I, uh, I trusted very deeply. He was a, an amazing, amazing manager, you know, one of the most empathetic uh, and caring people that you could imagine, and, you know, still a good friend of mine to this day. And, uh, you know, one time he sat me down and he said, you know, Julie, I got to be honest with you. Uh, you know, and I, I, I just really want you to hear this. Uh, you know, when I'm doing well and our projects are succeeding and, you know, the team is, is gelling and, you know, I've, and, you know, I feel like I have your support. And I feel like you, you know, give me a lot of encouragement and you give me, you know, a lot of, like, recognition and that's wonderful. But when I'm not doing well, and it feels like, you know, my team is struggling or we're, you know, going through a challenge, I don't feel that way. And I get the sense sometimes that you care more about how things are going than you care about me. And that was really hard for me to hear, you know, because obviously I cared deeply about him and I wanted to be the kind of manager, you know, that was, you know, there and, and had my people's back and that they could trust. But I'm also so grateful to him that he told me that because it made me, you know, reassess all of the, the ways, maybe consciously or subconsciously, that I was sending that impression, you know, that I was giving him and maybe other people on the team the sense that, you know, I was really all about the work and I was not about them and getting to know them as people. It completely transformed my perspective on management and you know, I don't think there's a week that passes where I don't think about that and, you know, where I, I you know, reflect on that and, and on the job that I'm doing. And if you, you know, take your own example of the best feedback that you've received, 
chances are the reason why you think it's so great is because it changed your behavior. You know, it shed light on something that you weren't aware of before and made you look at things in a different manner. And as a result, you changed and you felt that change was for the better. You know, you feel like you're a better person today, a more capable person today, a more, a more compassionate person because of the fact that you changed, you know, due to that feedback. And that's ultimately what feedback is all about. That's why we give it, that's why it matters, because it's the way that we grow and learn, and it's the way that we improve, and the way that we help others around us improve. The first thing to think about, though, with great feedback is, or any feedback, is that it is always contextual. It's not about the words. It's not about even, you know, what was said or the manner it was said. It's about, also, do you have that foundation of trust with that person? And in my case, you know, with uh, my rapport Robin, he was someone I trusted, and he knew that I trusted him, and, and we had that. And so he was able to tell me that, and I knew he was saying it out of the goodness of his heart because he really wanted to help me. And so I wasn't offended, and, you know, I wasn't, like, upset at him for, for saying those things. You know, it's like when you go to a, you know, try on clothing, and you, you put on an ugly green sweater, and you're there with your best friend, your best friend can say, wow, you look awful. And you're like, yeah, okay, you're right. Yeah, you know, I really do. But if, like, a stranger was walking past and turns to you and is like, you look awful, you could be like, that is so rude. You know, like, who is that person thinking? So, you know, we always have to talk about feedback in the context of the relationship and the way that you're able to make it, it the way that it gets easier and easier to be able to give, you know, honest, truthful, frequent feedback to someone is to be able to invest in that relationship. But it also goes the other way. The more that you feel like you are able to share feedback with someone and ask for their feedback in return, the more it also helps you build that bond of trust between, between people. So you might be thinking, great, you know, feedback, okay, but like how do I start giving it? Uh, and I find it helpful to just break down feedback into, you know, it's, it's various types. And we could talk about each type and, you know, how we would address each one. And the first bucket is not even uh, actually feedback. Uh, it's, it's just actually setting clear expectations. And, you know, uh, here's a, a letter that uh, my daughter wrote to Santa about two years ago. And she wanted to make it very clear to Santa that her expectations were she's getting an iPhone, <laughs> some food, preferably colorful or sweet, but I am not picky. And number three, no face wiping. So uh, the reason I bring this up is that, you know, before any feedback happens, it's usually you can save yourself the work of needing to give a lot of feedback if you make it really, really clear what the expectations are up front. And so, for example, if you decide to go to the gym and you decide to get a trainer because you want to improve your workouts, the first thing your trainer says to you isn't, hey, drop on the ground and give me 20 push-ups and let me see, you know, how you're doing. You know, they first sit you down, they try to understand, you know, what are your goals, why did you come to get a trainer, and then they tell you all the stuff that they have learned through years of training other people, which is, you know, like, here's how you might, you know, think about getting your best workout, and here's, you know, how many days you maybe want to, you know, work out versus exercise, and here's, you know, X or Y, you know, clothing that you might need to buy or whatever it is, right? But they prepare you, so you're not going into it completely blind. You know, you're taking uh, the best learnings or the, you know, uh, or the, the things that, you know, are common traps that people fall into and you hear that ahead of time so that hopefully you don't make those same mistakes or you go into it, you know, with, with a better uh, mental preparation. And so before you start any project, before you start sort of any, you know, uh, if, you, if you're a manager, you have a new report, it's just usually helpful to sit down with them and really clearly, you know, talk about each other's expectations or talk about, you know, what does a great job look like versus a mediocre job or a bad job, or just to talk about, you know, here's our North Star and here's what we're aspiring to. Make sure that you get on the same page. The second kind of feedback uh, I call task-specific feedback. And, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory. If someone does a task, you know, let's say they pick a berry or they you know, give a presentation or like I'm doing, you know, giving a talk right now, or, you know, they show some design work to you. 
right? This is probably the type of feedback that we're most used to if we do critique. How many of you guys do critique as a regular practice? So, you know, that's what it is. It's basically you're giving task-specific feedback. You're taking a thing that a person has done and you're giving them feedback about that. And usually, you know, this is the easiest place to start because it's the least personal. Now, I, I know that, you know, many of us still might take the critique feedback we get personally, but really you're trying to make a your comment about the work or about, you know, something that happened. You're not making a judgment about the person, right? And so that's why it is often an easier place to start and to be able to give feedback um, because it's much more about the thing at hand. The other thing to keep in mind about task-specific feedback, and actually, you know, with the room of designers, I think, you know, it sort of feels like you guys will probably all know this, because designers tend to be a lot better, is that, you know, feedback doesn't all have to be negative. It doesn't have to be all like, I only should give feedback if I'm pointing out the problems. Sometimes the most useful feedback is, you know, reinforcement of what's going well or what's positive. And usually the more precise it is, the more helpful it is. So not just like, your presentation was good, your design is, is nice, but you know, hey, the uh, you know, typography that you're using and the colors and the choices really you know, is, is extremely clear. You know, giving them something that makes you, you know, like helps explain why you thought this was good or why you thought this you know, continues to need work. But a lot of times talking about the positive is what people you know, can have as much impact, if not more, to help someone change their behavior because it makes them recognize what they're really great at, maybe what their hidden superpowers are. And sometimes when people hear that, then they, you know, it's like, oh, they get this sense that, okay, maybe I can take these strengths and I can apply them to other problems or I could, you know, find other ways to extend and have more impact because of these particular strengths. And so when you think about feedback, you know, start with task specific and start with, okay, what's going well? What should they do more of? And, and but still be as specific as possible. The third kind of feedback is behavioral feedback. And here we are getting to be uh, a little bit more personal. So behavioral feedback I define as like, you know, when you see, when you have enough examples where you're starting to make judgments about a, a pattern of behavior that you see, where you know, you start to say, or you start to have an impression where, wow, X is, very defensive, or, you know, X is such a great uh, team rallier, or like X is always so passionate about the work, you know, then you're, you're starting to, you know, have behavioral feedback about a person. And I've actually read, I've read, you know, thousands of Upward reviews that people write about their managers. Uh, the first thing that they always say is, I wish my manager gave me more feedback. But the second thing they say is, well, you know, my manager might be really good at giving me task-specific feedback. So maybe I... You know, I always know what my manager's opinion on my design work is, but I'm actually craving more, you know, feedback about my career, feedback about my strengths, feedback about my progression. And that's basically craving behavioral feedback, right? And so we all, you know, we need behavioral feedback in addition to task-specific feedback because it helps us see these patterns or these blind spots or these, again, superpowers in how we come across and how we do our work that is extremely valuable. And finally, the fourth is uh, uh, called, you know, 360 degree feedback. And that's just basically if you take a bunch of people who work with you, you know, like let's say three to seven peers, and you ask them for behavioral feedback, then what you get to see is a more well-rounded perspective where now you can pick out patterns. You know, what are the things, what are people saying that kind of everyone is saying, which in that case means, okay, let's pay attention because it's probably not just like a personality, you know, one-to-one -one thing. It's like actually a bigger pattern. Uh, and so, you know, how many of you guys are working at places where you have, you know, a formal performance review process or, or cycle? Yeah. And so a lot of times, you know, companies will, you know, do this, right, where you have that, you know, once a year or uh, twice a year. But even if you don't, you know, there's no reason you can't just get this feedback for yourself or ask your manager to collect it. You know, it just basically means you go out and you find you know, the people that you work closest with and you ask them, you know, those questions about behavioral feedback. Hey, what do you think are this person's strengths? How have they really had impact recently? What would you, you know, want this person to change or stop doing that will, you know, enable them to have more impact? 
Okay, so the important thing to keep in mind with feedback is that it really only counts if it makes things better. So, you know, if you give someone feedback and you feel happy, you know, you got it off your chest, you felt like you expressed yourself, but they don't change their behavior or don't, you know, do anything differently, you haven't really succeeded. And so feedback is really about what is the impact that it has on that other person. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Um, so four questions to kind of ask yourself to help ensure that that's happening. The first is just simply, am I giving feedback often enough? You know, I mentioned in those upward reviews that I've read, you know, thousands of them over the years, this continually comes up as the most important thing people are asking for. All of us are wanting more feedback. You know, it, chances are, you know, how many of you in this room feel like you, you know, would want more feedback from your peers or your manager? Right? I, I think it's just because, you know, it's, we, we, we crave knowing. Like, we have our own perception of how we think we're doing. We have things that we're proud of, things we consider our strengths, things that we, you know, uh, uh, feel like we need to work on. And oftentimes, it's so important for us to understand whether or not that's well calibrated. You know, whether our managers are seeing the same things that we're seeing, whether they're recognizing us for the things that we're doing well. And also, there's always that fear we have of just like, wow, like, does everyone actually think I'm an idiot? You know, like, or, you know, all of those uh, kind of questions you occasionally ask yourself. And sometimes when you just check in with people and you hear that feedback, then it, you know, you feel like you're on solid ground. You feel like you have a good understanding of where you are. And that, that helps, you know, so much in your day to day. And so the first thing to just, before we get into like the nitty gritty, the how, just simply ask yourself, Am I giving feedback often enough? And the answer is probably not. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't think any of us are. And one you know, rule of thumb, and I think about this a lot as a manager, is you know, if I see a report in action throughout the day, you know, I, I saw a piece of their design work, or I saw them you know, participate in a meeting, I saw them give a presentation, I try and challenge myself, is there something I can tell them, you know, a small nugget that would be useful for them to hear? And again, this could be about something that worked really well. It could be something that could be better. Um, but, you know, if you challenge yourself to try and do that for everybody, you know, uh, for everything you see them doing, then it becomes much more natural, right? Because it becomes that part of your practice rather than a thing that you think about once every six months when it's time to write some formal, you know, peer feedback. The second thing to ask yourself is, is my feedback being heard? Now, one time I had a report who was underperforming. And, you know, she uh, was clearly unmotivated and not, you know, terribly excited about what she was doing. And so, you know, she was, her productivity was really low. It was taking her twice or three times as long to finish something as it would, you know, everybody else on that team. So I knew I had to give her that feedback and, you know, have a conversation with her. And I remember being really, really nervous. You know, I was like practicing the conversation in front of the mirror. I was like writing all of my points. You know, I like scripted it out. I memorized it. I practiced it with a friend. And so the moment came and I sat her down and then I just, you know, you know said everything that was on my script. And then I was like, okay, cool. You know, and afterwards I patted myself on the back. You know, I'd done that hard job. And the next day, you know, a, a colleague pulls me aside and she's like, hey, Julie, can I talk to you? I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, I just talked to your report, and you know, why did you tell her that you that she couldn't browse, you know, internet sites while she's doing her job, or she couldn't go out and have lunch? I was like, what? Like, that's not what I said. You know, I was talking about like, you know, I was trying to point out the fact that it was her, you know, low productivity. And yes, I may have used some examples like, wow, you know, maybe you're not motivated because you know you're you're taking these long lunches and you know you're like you know shopping while you're, you know, doing stuff at, at work. But that wasn't the point, you know, of what I was trying to say. Doesn't matter. That's what she heard. You know, and, and so that's, and so the, I clearly had failed and it might have been because I was so nervous and because I was sort of, you know, rambling or whatever it is, but she got a very different message than what I intended. And if you've ever played a game of telephone, I mean, we all know, you know, we, it's very common for us to misunderstand each other, right? So when we think we might have said something, 
maybe someone else heard you know, a very different message and maybe it's because of our body language or it's because of something else that conveyed that message. We can't blame them. You know, we have to look at and figure out how we can you know, improve the way that we're giving that feedback. So a few things I've learned over the years that help. The first is just to check in at the end of a conversation. So you know, it's like, okay, we've had our talk. Great. Now, before we close, what are you and I taking away from this conversation? You know, just check in, right? You know, ask. It's also sometimes helpful to follow up on, you know, what was discussed in person via email. You know, that's why it's a good best practice. You know, after your meeting, sometimes someone will take notes and send out the notes because now there's a written documentation and record of what was said. And, you know, usually with email or with writing, you could spend a little bit more time refining and, you know, being more succinct so it's like the actual message. So that's like usually good practice. If you're going to have a hard conversation with someone, don't just say it and walk away. Maybe, you know, follow up afterwards and, and you know, uh, put that into writing, right? Our other ways to do that is just to, you know, sometimes ensure that maybe, you know, you have a message for this person. You're not sure you delivered it properly or maybe, you know, you know the other person doesn't really, maybe they don't trust you. You know, maybe they, you, you guys aren't really great friends and so, you know, they're going to be skeptical about whatever it is you tell them. Is there someone else on the team who has the same feedback? You know, could you maybe get two or three people to say that same message to that person so that it sticks and that it's heard? The third question is, does my feedback lead to positive action? So I'll give you another example. I had a report once, uh, let's call him George, and you know, George had a thing where he, uh, his presentations were really, really unclear. He would ramble and it would be really hard to understand the main point he was making. And so one time, you know, I sat him down and I shared with him, you know, I was like, George, you know, you just gave a presentation, but it was really hard for the audience to follow along because, you know, you rambled and it wasn't clear enough. So, you know, let's work on the clarity of your presentation. He was like, great, thank you, so helpful. And I was like, great, great. Next week, he gives another presentation. Same thing happens, you know, still really hard to follow, not sure exactly what he's recommending, you know. And so afterwards, I'm like, George, you know, like, hey, it's still happening, you know, like still, still kind of unclear. He was like, what? Like, like I, you know, I spent a long time. Uh, did you notice that I, you know, put Roman numerals in front of each of the sections and, you know, I like tightened up the organization of the slides? And so my takeaway is, you know, he heard my feedback, but he didn't know how to make it actionable. He didn't know how to change his behavior such that it would resolve that problem or address the thing, right? And, you know, of course, he's extremely well-intentioned about it, but the problem was I wasn't being specific or clear enough in my feedback. I told him, you know, that his presentation was confusing, but his interpretation of confusing and mine are different. And so, you know, the more specific that I could be, look okay, at why exactly was it confusing? It was confusing because you made, you know, seven points and you said, you know, you gave seven recommendations and we weren't really sure which one it is that you're, you think is the best. You know, or, you know, that would have, I think, been a lot more tangible, a lot more concrete about what he could do next time to make his presentation clear. Sometimes you can also just offer the suggestion, you know, hey, next time consider just showing three options instead of seven. You know, it's hard for people to keep track of, of all seven. Or, you know, to, uh, you know, end with a slide that clearly shows which is the recommendation that you think we should go through. And I could have given him more of those tangible suggestions as well in order to get to that positive outcome. Finally, the last thing to keep in mind, the question to ask yourself is, are you asking for feedback enough? Because let's say you are amazing at giving other people feedback. But if it feels like you're never, you know, asking for feedback, then it's kind of, you know, you're in this like kind of weird situation because the point of feedback is that you're supposed to help other people. And if you believe in it enough to, you know, constantly do that for others, like why don't you do that for yourself? And actually one of my reports called me out for this, you know, one time when she was like, hey, I noticed that, you know, you have all these great suggestions for me and the team. Like, how could you never ask us for feedback? She was like, oh my God, you know. It's a really good point, right? And, you know, if you ask for feedback, a lot of times that's one of the, early, the easiest ways to create that trust with someone. You know, if someone understand that you're working with, you'd say you're working with a PM, an engineering partner, you want to build that trust, 
you know, make sure that you ask them, hey, I want to understand what your goals are. And over time, hey, I want to understand what you think I could be doing to be a better partner for you or what I could be doing for this project that we're working on to be more successful. That's a very low ego thing to say. And it's something that, you know, if, and if you genuinely say it with the intent of following through and, and you know, wanting to improve, that earns you a lot of goodwill and credibility. Okay, so now let's talk about delivering critical or difficult feedback. So this is, I think this serves its own attention because, you know, there are times where, hey, maybe you don't have that perfect relationship with someone else, but they're doing that thing that is really, really annoying. Or, you know, you're a manager and, you know, you have disappointing news to give and, you know, it, it, there's no way to sugarcoat that. You know, you had to pick someone to lead this project and five people raised their hand and you're going to have to tell four of them that they weren't selected. Or you have someone who just is, isn't performing well or they're not going to get the promotion that they wanted or, you know, you think that they're not a good fit for the team. That happens and that's something that, you know, we need to, to think about and, and we need to actually uh, still deliver. So the first thing to keep in mind is that you have to remind yourself why this matters. You know, why are you putting yourself at risk telling someone something that they don't want to hear? And it's because you respect that person and you real, you know, you want to have them, you know, get this perspective, change their behavior, you know, get to that point where they feel like they're, they're better off because of it. You know, well, oftentimes, you know, if we don't want to give feedback because we don't want to feel bad, we don't want to, you know, come across as the bad guy, we're doing it to protect ourselves. We're not doing it for the other person. You know, I know most of us would rather that people tell us things straight. And, you know, if they're having a problem with us, we'd rather hear exactly what that is. And, I know, like, you know, when, whenever I pull the audience, everyone's like, yeah, obviously, yes, I don't want people to lie to me. Uh, and so, but yet, you know, we often shy away because we think... We, you know, they don't want to hear it when, in, in fact, we just don't want to put ourselves out there because it's hard to do. When you do go out and give feedback to someone else with good intent, and I think this is also important because I have had moments in which I wanted to give someone feedback because I wanted to be right, you know, because I wanted to prove them wrong, because I wanted to do this for my own ego instead of truly helping them. You know, that's, those are not the right reasons, and if you give feedback for those reasons, then the other person is going to, you know, see that, and they're obviously probably not going to hear it. Uh, but if you truly want to give them the feedback because you're trying to help them, then even hard or negative or critical feedback, you know, you're doing it out of a place of selflessness, and that's, that's the first thing to remember. The second thing is to assess the context of your relationship and to ask yourself what's the most effective way for the feedback to be heard. Now, maybe you do have that person on your team and, it, and they're doing that thing that's super annoying, but they also, you know, don't like you. And so <laughs> if you tell them that, they're just going to think it's you continuing to have a beef with them, right? And they, so sometimes you just have to actually recognize, you know, actually this person needs to hear that feedback, but I may not be the best person to give it. And don't do it because you're shirking your responsibility and you don't want to be the bad guy. You know, do it because you genuinely don't actually think it's going to be effective. And then, you know, consider, okay, is there another person on the team that they trust and that you know well and who's clearly also seeing this behavior and could you, you know, maybe have them give that feedback or could, you know, three of you be giving the same feedback to that person, you know, in, in order to help them really internalize that message, right? But, you know, it, it, you, it's not, it always, it doesn't, different, the same words can be said by different people and they will land in different ways because of what the uh, foundation of, and the context of that relationship is. The third thing is, okay, so if it is you and you're going to give it, then tell it straight. You know, if you're going to sit someone down as a manager and give them, you know, news about they're not getting their promotion, you know, they're not being the lead, or, you know, when you have a performance issue, it should be the first words out of your mouth. Don't chit-chat about the weather. Don't, like, you know, ask about how their kids are doing. You know, just, just say it, right? Say it. And, uh, and don't try and, you know, Push it with like other compliments, because I, I just think makes the message confusing. If that's just, if there's a thing that they need to hear, say it plainly and tell it to them straight. And, you know, don't try and make it out to be, uh, you know, uh, lesser than what you truly feel. Um, because again, that's only you protecting yourself. That's not what's going to most help that person. 
But you know, you also recognize that like this is your truth, right? Again, it's your truth. No one can take that away from you. But your truth may not be their truth. And so, you know, you have to share kind of here's what I feel, here's why I feel that way, and here's how I want to work together with you, you know, to 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 address that concern. Because you have to acknowledge that again, if you truly want to help them, you know, you have a role to play in it as well, right? It's not Feedback isn't just judgment. It's not you, you know, saying you are a C minus. You know, it's you sort of saying, hey, I see this issue, and this is how I feel, and I want to be there to help you, or also maybe recognize that that I'm off. I'm off base. And so uh, the fourth thing is just to remain curious about the other person's perspective. You know, give them have a room in the in the in the conversation for them to share with you you know, what it is that they think or how they're responding or whether or not your feedback is resonating or whether or not they just completely disagree. If you want a template, this is the one that I like um, because it, you know, really puts it into uh, all of those four pieces, uh, you know, together. It's, you know, when you made that comment and critiqued the other day, you know, when you didn't respond to my email, when you, whatever it is, I felt I was upset, I was disappointed, I was concerned because, you know, here's the reason why. You know, it didn't feel like you respected me. It uh, felt like, you know, you were shutting me out of the conversation, whatever it is. I wanted to bring this up with you to understand your perspective. Again, that's used pausing and, and acknowledging this is your truth, but they may have some different truth. And see what we can do to work it, to, you know, work through it together. And that's you inviting you know, them to be a part of that conversation and, uh, and for that kind of mutual and joint problem solving. Okay, so now it's time for our uh, find your partner and do some practice component of uh, the workshop. And so, you know, I know many of you guys came with your teammates, came with friends, uh, but for the purposes of this, you know, if you guys will spend a few minutes and introduce yourself to someone new that you don't know. But I'm gonna put up a few scenarios on the board. Uh, we'll start with the first one. I'm gonna, and they're gonna get, you know, they're gonna start like, you know, more lightweight and easy and we're gonna work our way up and challenge on, on these scenarios. But with your partner, um, pretend, you know, think through this question and then now pretend like your partner is that person and, you know, and I want these to be really actionable. I want you to leave here with, you know, these nuggets so that you could go and talk to someone tomorrow, a coworker, a manager, whoever it is, tomorrow or within the next week and actually you know, give this feedback for real. Uh, but first, practice this with your partner. You know, um, share with them the context. Who is this person? You know, uh, uh, what's the, the situation? And, you know, what it is that you want to say to that person and then, you know, actually deliver the feedback and then get your partner's feedback and then switch roles, you know, do that for, for your partner. Cool, so the first one is, think of a college, colleague you know who could use some additional encouragement and support, you know, sometime within the next week. And what, you know, positive behavioral feedback would you tell that person that you think would be useful for them to hear? So now we're gonna move on to your manager. Uh, think of something your manager is just doing really well. You know, I think as a manager, you know, I often tell people I don't get nearly as much feedback as I'd like, and I think it's because people assume that I, you know, maybe uh, am experienced at the job or know it well. But it is super, super valuable for managers to hear both what they're doing well or what specific guidance, or if there was, you know, a one-on-one -on -one or a meeting or whatever that seemed like it was well run, that is super helpful feedback. And also to just get feedback about how, you know, uh, I could be doing a better job. And so, you know, your manager, I, I promise you, you know, should be, wants to hear and is, is uh, it's gonna help them to hear more of your feedback as well. So go back to your partner and think about what you wanna tell your manager. Shall we move on to number three? Okay, now this is thinking of something that you'd like your manager to change or stop doing. So we heard some great, you know, managers that are giving great feedback. Okay, but what do you want them to change or stop doing? Okay, all right, so this is uh, the last one. And uh, 
I want to think about meetings because this is, uh, I think, a, a topic that's probably very near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, how many of you guys think you're in meetings that aren't super valuable? <laughs> Right? So, uh, a great way to address that is to be able to give some feedback to the meeting organizer. You know, maybe it is your manager or maybe it's, you know, your PM, you know, maybe it's like an engineer or somebody else on your team who's running that meeting. But what is a meeting that you have that you think maybe isn't the best use of your time or other people's time right now? And, you know, how might you tell that person about it so that, you know, we can change the meeting and, and get that to be a, a better use of everyone's time. Okay, the other two um, that, uh, number four and number five was your designer colleague that isn't great at critique. And how would you give feedback to him or her? And uh, number six was uh, accept that partner that you find challenging to work with and what are some actionable steps that you'll take you know, to, to give that feedback or to better build your relationship? Yeah. Oh, XFN, sorry, cross-functional. So this could be like your PM partner, your engineering partner, your research partner. Cool. But thank you, and again, the whole goal of this, and, and so please bear with me, is that you all walk out of this room tonight with the commitment to actually put some of this in practice in your day-to-day -day job. If you remember, if you wait here and we spend all this time together, but it does not change if your behavior, then I have failed. <laughs> all right, let's give it a big hand to Julie for this evening. Thank you as well to Julie, to Zendesk, and to all of you, you guys were amazing. Um, I hope you got something out of this, and remember, give your feedback, give it tomorrow. Thank you everyone Thank you. for joining us.